some very good studies about what happens to the uninsured. And the data suggests that many of them absolutely do not have the money to afford insurance. Their employer does not offer them health insurance. Going out to the private market to afford it is terribly expensive. I mean, and there was just, there was a really interesting piece um, in the New York Times about um, a woman who lost her job. Her name is Donna Davinsky. And it's entitled, Money Won't Pay You won't buy you health insurance. Um, she completed a dozen applications for herself and her daughter and her husband. And they were constantly rejected because she had bunions, her husband had a cataract, and her daughter had asthma. Okay. Um, <laughs> Our premiums, which were reasonable at first, have increased substantially over the last six years. The average annual increase has been 20%. I'm now paying premiums that are more than double what they were initially. And because they are high deductible policies, we're still paying most of the medical bills ourselves. She writes, the new health care reform legislation is not perfect. Nothing that complex to be, but I have no doubt that the system is broken and reform is absolutely essential. If we are not going to have universal coverage, but are going to rely on employer plans, then we must offer individual self-employed people and small businesses a place to purchase insurance at a reasonable rate. And I love her last paragraph. Excuse my bias, but <laughs> if members of Congress feel so strongly about undoing this important legislation, perhaps we should stop providing them with health insurance. Let's credit their pay for the amount that has been paid by the taxpayers and let them try to buy health insurance in the individual market. My bet is that they would all be denied. Health insurance reform might suddenly not seem to them like such a bad idea. Mm -hmm. That was in the uh, February 20th op-ed section of the New York Times. Other questions? We're all keeping a bunch of questions you were trying to ask me. Well, I, I kind of, I mean, can I ask one question that's different than those? I mean, sure. apparently there's no subsidy to a family of four that makes over $45,000 a year. Was that right? If they're buying insurance and if, it's, and if they don't have other special needs that would qualify them. Right. I mean, if, if, if somebody can opt out if the insurance costs more than 9% of their income, mm -hmm. the 9% of, let's say somebody's talking over, plus the 9% of somebody making 50000 the family making 50000 4500 and it sounds like for information that the average health insurance costs 13700 Now. Not okay. But with the insurance exchanges, well, it's predicted that it will be less. By insurance exchanges, you mean? <laughs> These are the state-run insurance pools that will, cut, will include bunches of insurers who will put together <coughs> insurance policies at reasonable prices for people who are low and moderate income to buy them. Okay. Yeah. Um, Janet, I have a question. I'll let you speak up. Oh. Um, I'm, I'm your comparative data chat. Cha right. But so I've heard and read. Um, I don't know how to put it, claims that, that comparing the United States to, you know, the UK, Germany, France, and, and, and Canada underestimates or, or, or uh, doesn't account for the diversity of the American population in comparison to those other nations. How do you well, that, that is certainly a critique that often comes up, that, that the other countries are not as diverse. But Great Britain has a lot of diversity, and Canada has a lot of diversity. Yeah. And so but we are, can't. But are there studies that that yes that that normally can normally can yes. Help? Yeah. And it, we still spend much much more. Because that's almost never specified when we need to. You know, it's just well, let's compare the United States to Canada. Right. You know, and then the, you know the differences in number of population, the very relatively small number of, of 
There, there, there have been some very good analyses that have controlled for population differences, and we still, we still spend far more. And I mean, places like England, for example, send a nurse to the home for the first five years of a child's life to make sure that they're immunized, to weigh them, to measure them, to make sure they're making developmental progress, to make sure that breastfeeding is going correctly. And by law, you cannot turn away the health visitors. So they have much better outcomes across the board for the five and under than we have in the United States. And we're not putting a lot of efforts into, you know, prevention. And all these countries have better um, maternity benefits than we do. So women can take time off and so they're paid and take care of their infants. Done. Um, yeah, I, I, I would guess uh, the thing that surprises me the most, I mean, I was recently in the hospital, and the thing that struck me was the amount of technology that is used, and I thought, this must really be driving up costs. It does. And, and I mean, it was tremendous and fantastic and amazing, but I thought, well, if, if all this technology is, is being uh, accelerated, isn't it kind of like a sort of a, a force on its own that's sort of like pressuring everything? Well, it is. I mean, if you were going into a general practitioner's office in London, the general practitioner has a stethoscope and very little other equipment. Um, the famous story I like to tell is I was visiting, I was doing a, a course in London for Emory and Johns Hopkins University, and I fell down the tube stairs, the subway stairs. And by the time Alan got back to the apartment, my ankle looked like that. And he said, okay, we need to go to the emergency room. And we went to the emergency room. Yeah, and they looked at the, my ankle and they said, put your foot up. And I put my foot up and they kicked he hit the bottom of the heel and I didn't jump off the table. I said, it's not broken. We're going to wrap it up. You'll be fine. They were right. They did not x-ray it. They did not give me a CT scan. They did not do an MRI. Did it affect my outcome? No. Did it save money? Yes. <laughs> and the funny story is they wouldn't even charge me. They said, oh, it's too complicated. You don't live here. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in England, care is free at the point of service. And patients don't go to the doctor every day, but their outcomes are sure better than in the United mm. States. Shalita. Um, how successful do you think it's going to be to change the culture of medical school with this new um, stimulus money that's intending to train these new primary care physicians? It's going to be really hard, and people are just going to have to be convinced that, you know, the increased benefits of being a primary care physician will work. And there's some thought that maybe medical schools need to start recruiting different types of medical students who will commit to go into primary care. Now, whether they can make sure they'll eventually go into primary care is always a question, but... Have they specified how this training is going to look, or is this one Not of the dynamics? Not yet. Okay. Not yet. It's still, still okay. a little Peter? Just to go up in a different direction off of your yeah. point, I've heard it said, though, that you know, technology, especially the electronic medical record, is one of the cornerstones that people will reuse. That technology, yes, having a centralized <coughs> electronic medical record will ensure the fact that who's ever treating the patient will have the patient's record at their fingertips, that duplicate tests won't have to be done, that test results can be available more quickly. I mean, right now, many of us who are patients carry our test results right. from physician to physician, you know, and have to ask each physician for the results so we can give it to the specialist and the super specialist. And so, a lot of the issue with the technology, the cost of the technology, is, is the testing and the intervention. Um, and I mean, even, you know, surgery is overdone. For example, recently there have been two reports on breast cancer suggesting that, first of all, um, there are too many women who have most of their lymph nodes removed and it doesn't 